revolutionary press in Europe and thereby laid the foundations of revolutionary agitation in his own country. He dealt in his periodical, which is called The Bell, with every kind of matter of topical interest. He exposed, he denounced, he mocked, he became a kind of Voltaire of the mid-19th century, at least as far as the Russians are concerned. And so effective were his articles, they were written with such verve, such brilliance, and at the same time, such sincerity and such passion, that people in Russia read them, although they were, of course, officially forbidden. Indeed, it was said that the emperor himself read them. Certainly, his officials read them. And during the heyday of his influence, Herzen really exercised very considerable power in Russia itself, by exposing abuses, by naming names, and above all, by appealing to those liberal sentiments, which are even in the very heart of the Tsarist bureaucracy, weren't completely dead, at any rate, during the 50s and 60s. However, it isn't really with this aspect of him that I want to deal. Perhaps before going further, I ought to try and give you some kind of description of what Herzen was like as a man, what he was like to meet, what kind of uh, personality he had. And I think perhaps the best description of it is given in the book after which these lectures are called, in the marvellous decade, by his friend Anjankov himself. Let me read it to you. This description, of course, is written fairly late, somewhere in the late 60s. Anjankov says, I must own that I was puzzled and overwhelmed when I first came to know Herzen by this extraordinary mind which darted from one topic to another with unbelievable swiftness, with inexhaustible wit and brilliance, which could seize in the turn of somebody's talk, in some simple incident, in some abstract idea, that vivid feature which gives them expression and life. He had a most astonishing capacity for instantaneous, unexpected juxtaposition of quite dissimilar things. And this gift he had in a very high degree, fed as it was by the powers of the subtlest observation and a very solid fund of encyclopedic knowledge. He held it to such a degree that in the end it sometimes exhausted his listeners. The inextinguishable fireworks of his speech, the inexhaustible fantasy and invention, a kind of prodigal opulence of intellect, perpetually astonished and delighted his listeners. After the always ardent, but invariably severe sentences of Vilinsky, the glancing, gleaming, perpetually changing, often paradoxical and irritating, but always wonderfully clever talk of Herzen, demanded of those who were with him not only interest, but intense concentration, perpetual alertness, because you always had to be ready for a sudden reply. On the other hand, nothing that was cheap, nothing tawdry, could stand even half an hour of contact with him. All pretentiousness, all pompousness, all pedantic self-importance simply fled from him or melted like wax before a fire. I knew people, many of them what would be called serious and practical men, who couldn't bear Herzen's presence. On the other hand, there were others who gave him the most blind and passionate adoration. He had a wonderful critical disposition, which really was something in his mind from his birth. An astonishing capacity for exposing and denouncing the dark sides of life. And he showed this very, very early during the Moscow period of his life, of which I'm speaking. Even then, Herzen's mind was in the highest degree rebellious and unmanageable, with a kind of innate, organic detestation of anything which seemed to him to be an accepted rule sanctified by general silence about some unverified truth. In such cases, the, uh, so to speak, predatory powers of his intellect would rise up in force and come into the open. Sharp, cunning, resourceful. He lived in Moscow, still unknown to the public, but in his own circle of friends, he was already celebrated as a witty and dangerous observer of his own circle. And of course, what wasn't known was that he, he, he what he couldn't altogether conceal either, was that he kept secret dossiers secret protocols of his own about his nearest and dearest, in the privacy of his own thoughts. People who stood by his side, all innocence and trustfulness, couldn't fail to be amazed and sometimes extremely annoyed when they suddenly came on this or that side of his uh, activity, of the secret activity of his mind. Strangely enough, Herzen combined with this the tenderest, most loving relations to his chosen friends, although they could never escape his pungent analyses. But this is explained by another side of his character. As if to restore the equilibrium 
uh, of his moral organization, nature took care to place in his soul one unshakable belief, one unconquerable inclination. Herzen believed in the noble instincts of the human heart. His analysis grew silent and reverent before the instinctive impulses of the moral organism as the sole indubitable truth of existence. He admired in everybody anything which he thought to be a noble or passionate impulse, however mistaken, and he never, never laughed about that. This twofold, uh, so to speak, contradictory play of his nature, suspicion and denial on one hand, and blind faith on the other, often led to puzzles and to misunderstandings between him and his friends, and used to lead to quarrels and to scenes. But it's precisely in this crucible of altercation of this type that up to the very day of his departure for Europe, the people's devotion to him used to be tested and strengthened instead of disintegrating. And this is perfectly intelligible. In all that Herzen did, in all that Herzen thought at the time, there never was the slightest trace of anything false. No malignant feeling nourished in darkness. No calculation, no treachery. On the contrary, the whole of him was always there in every one of his words and deeds. And there was another cause which made one sometimes forgive him even insults, a cause which may seem unplausible to people who didn't know him. With all his proud, strong, energetic intellect, Herzen had a wholly gentle, amiable, almost feminine character. Under the severe exterior of the skeptic and the satirist, under the cover of a most unceremonious and not at all reticent humour, there dwelt the heart of a child. He had a curious angular kind of charm, angular kind of delicacy. But it was extended particularly to beginners, particularly to seekers after something. People who were trying out their powers, they found sources of strength and confidence in his advice. He took them into the most intimate communion with himself and his ideas. When, which nevertheless didn't stop him at times from using his full destructive analytic powers, from performing exceedingly painful psychological experiments on these very same people at the very same time. This is Onion Scott's description, and it is a very, very vivid, and I should think a very true, as well as very sympathetic one. But it is as nothing to the impression which the reader gains if he read Herzen's own prose in the great masterpiece, My Past and Thoughts. There, his personality comes fully out. The impression which that leaves upon the mind is indelible and far superior, far more magnificent than even Onionkov's good pages. The chief influence on him, as a young man in Moscow University, as upon all the young people of his time, was of course that of Hegel. And curiously enough, in Herzen's case, although he was a fairly orthodox Hegelian at the beginning of his intellectual activity, he, as always, turned his Hegelianism into something very odd, something very personal to himself something very different from the academic conclusions which the more serious-minded and the more um, uh, pedantic of his contemporaries normally deduced from the Hegelian doctrine. The chief effect upon him of Hegelianism was the belief that no given theory, no simple doctrine, no one interpretation of life, above all, no simple, coherent, well-constructed scheme which people believed in, whether it was a great French mechanistic uh, theorists of the 18th century, or the German Romantic constructions of the 19th, or the great buildings put up by the utopians like Saint-Simon or Fourier, or the socialist uh, structures of Cabet or Leroux or Louis Blanc, but all of which were very popular at this time, that none of these magnificent edifices, none of these great, simple, coherent buildings, which were regarded as solutions to all the problems of life, none of these could conceivably be true.